Our guest today is John Nichols. He is the Washington correspondent for The Nation magazine, a contributing writer for The Progressive and In These Times, and the author of a number of books, including The S Word, The Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party, and his latest from Verso Books is Coronavirus Criminals and Pandemic Profiteers, Accountability for Those Who Caused the Crisis. Thank you so much for joining us, John. It's a real honor to be with you. Thanks for, so much for having me. So the book kind of reads almost like the kind of introductory remarks for a lawsuit against some of these characters. <laughs> um, it's it's almost like each chapter is introducing an indictment against Donald Trump, Mike Pence, Jeff Bezos, et cetera. Um, but I wanted to start in the intro because you start the book with a kind of profile in the story of a man named um, Mike Jackson. Mm -hmm. Why did you choose to open your book with his story and how is it illustrative of tr the Trump administration's COVID response? I'm so appreciative that you started there because one of the things that I tried to do with the book uh, was to never forget the human side of this, that in this country, as we speak, we're coming close to a million deaths as a result of COVID. And we know from studies by The Lancet and others that as, as much as 40% of the death rate in the first year of the pandemic was unnecessary. People died not because uh, of you know something that was inevitable, but because they weren't cared for by their government, by their employers, by the billionaire class of this country. And so I always wanted to have that human element in, in each of the chapters of the book. And Mike Jackson uh, was the starting point because his story to my mind was so compelling. Uh, he worked in a Briggs and Stratton plant in suburban Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He had a large family. Uh, he worked for the same reason that an awful lot of people work. He needed to support his family and the job meant a lot to him. As a matter of fact, as COVID hit and the fear of losing jobs became more and more of a factor for people. We saw a lot of working class people who kind of redoubled their efforts to get to work. They, they didn't want to lose their jobs. And, and he was certainly one of these folks. Uh, and he was also a, a member of the Steelworkers Union. And uh, he and his union at this factory raised concerns about the lack of, of basic protections for workers. They said, you know, look, we don't have the screens between us. We work face to face. Uh, and we don't have protections there. We don't have the, the proper safety gear. Uh, they said, there's a problem here and, and it really needs to be addressed. It was not adequately addressed and Mike Jackson got sick. Uh, he left the factory one day, uh, not feeling well, but as again, with so many working class folks, he came back to work because uh, he was afraid, didn't want to lose his job. Uh, and he ultimately collapsed in the factory. He was taken to a hospital. He did in fact have COVID and he died. Um, and he was dying. He died in that early stage of the pandemic when so many people were passing. And his story might have just been another of, of the stories of those who died. But a fabulous group in the Milwaukee area, in fact, several fabulous groups in the Milwaukee area, uh, union organizations, as well as Voces de la Frontera, which works a lot with uh, immigrant workers, uh, took up his story and they made it really central to their advocacy for the protection of workers in uh, in workplaces in that city and across the country. Where it intersects with Donald Trump uh, is, of course, that, uh, that at the same time that, that Mike Jackson was warning about the lack of safety uh, in his plant and other workers across the country were, Donald Trump was saying, well, the pandemic isn't a big deal. Uh, it's, uh, he was literally downplaying the pandemic, saying that, uh, that it wasn't as serious as people suggested, even joking with uh, Bob Woodward about you know, lying to the American people about it. And then suggesting that uh, the pandemic would be done, you know, momentarily. It'll be done by Easter of 2020 or, or something like that. And and so here you had a working class person, urgently saying, you know, we need to be protected. Ultimately dying uh, because there was a lack of protection. And then a president at the same time, uh, literally neglecting the the basic responsibilities that could have cared for uh, workers like Mac Mike Jackson. Yeah, I think your book does a great job of centralizing the power differential that people have, where you have people scrambling to create a kind of democratic worker-led response mm -hmm. 
-hmm. to this enormous disparity that they have in power over the working conditions of their life, mm -hmm. it, you know, in contrast to the federal government or the state. Um, I think it's also interesting that, you know, there was a perception among a lot of people that Trump would fight for the working man. You know, he was elected in part because of his promise to protect workers' jobs, to reopen factories, his kind of um, American protectionism and, and uh, aggression with China and our trade agreements. Um, but the pandemic saw workers being thrown into this sawmill of capitalism. Can you talk about some more of the real worker-centered responses um, to the pandemic and what would it have looked like if the administration centered that in their response as well? Or if they even paid attention to it. Yeah, well, yeah, that's, that's true. And, and, or I didn't actively it. undermine it. Yeah, yes. no, you're right, yeah. yep. Uh, would that would that there had been that that uh, centralizing thinking and that 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 deeper deeper concern, but it wasn't there. Um, there, you ask a, such a good question. There are so many ways to to come at this. In each of the chapters, of, uh, or most of the chapters, I should say, I, I really do try to focus on individuals who, at a very early stage, recognized the crisis and had because they worked on the front lines real good responses. They knew what to do. And uh, I'll give you an example. There was in the chapter I write on Elaine Chow, who was Secretary of Transportation. I begin with a, uh, a worker up in uh, a bus driver up in the Seattle area. And if you'll recall back to February, early March of 2020, it was Seattle was the first hotspot. It was the first part of the country where we were actually seeing a lot of cases. And uh, this guy was driving bus up there. And, and, you know, said on the blog of his union, look, um, this is scary stuff. This is really bad. And he referred to buses as uh, cruise ships on land because we'd heard all these cases of cruise ships where everybody was getting sick. And he said, you know, bus is sort of like that. All these people from all these different places get on the bus. They bring whatever ailments they've got onto that bus. And the one person who's there the whole time is the bus driver uh, for eight, nine, 10 hours a day. And, uh, and he was saying, this isn't safe. We are. We don't have adequate protections. We don't have screens. We don't have a situation where people can get in at the back of the bus. Uh, we're charging to get on the bus, so you're having to, you know, still do all the things where you, you know, show your pass or you, you know, give money and transfer it back and forth. And he was pointing out all the problems and getting no real response uh, to the point where uh, his union was saying, you know, drivers were actually making their own masks and making their own protective gear. Uh, to try in those early stages to save their lives. Well, this guy I'm talking about got sick and uh, he ended up becoming very, very sick. And tragically, as one of his union stewards, I think it was one of his union stewards, was taking the family to the hospital to see him, perhaps for the last time, they got a call that uh, he wasn't going to make it. He wasn't going to last until the family got there. And uh, they and ultimately, this, this uh, union officer, uh, recall, recounted hearing the, the family saying their goodbyes uh, in this, this deeply painful, um, you know, wrenching uh, moment. And then we juxtapose that with uh, Elaine Chow, uh, Secretary of Transportation, who knew at the earliest stages of this crisis that it was going to be severe, uh, that people working in public transit were going to be some of the most vulnerable because they're encountering so many people. Uh, not more vulnerable than nurses per se, or, or many other workers, but certainly in a very, very vulnerable place. And from the earliest moments, people were begging for a national mass mandate. They were saying, you know, put a mass mandate on public transit, on, on transportation in the country. You as the Secretary of Transportation have the ability to do this. And yet throughout the whole first year, she refused to do so. We didn't get a mass mandate until after the end of Trump's presidency, and when uh, Elaine Chao was gone. And it was just, to me, one of these absolutely painful examples of where the workers knew, uh, A, that they were threatened. They knew that there were things that could be done to protect them. They begged for that protection. They did not get it. And they didn't not only not get it from government, they also didn't get it from their, their employers, from managers, from other folks. And, and I guess what we come back to again and again, chapter after chapter uh, in the book, we were told that this was a time for shared sacrifice. The workers sacrificed. They went to their jobs, uh, often out of a sense of duty. 
that they really felt they were doing something that was essential, they got sick and they died. And the politicians, they got, you know, off to Walter Reed for the best care possible. Uh, and the billionaires got incredibly richer. Uh, and so there wasn't shared sacrifice. There was sacrifice for the poor and the working class. And there was, uh, you know, enrichment and political advancement for the elites. Yeah, reading that chapter on Elaine Chow, I, I got this kind of image in my head of generals sending, you know, the poor working people onto the battlefield while they sit back and, you know, sip drinks and discuss strategy because she really did seem after this overwhelming amount of evidence, different union leaders speaking out, speaking to her directly, yeah. sending correspondence over and over and over again. She consistently used this refrain like, we need to be aware that there can be too much intervention. We need to let the market do its work. We need to let businesses define the appropriate strategies for them. Mm -hmm. And this consistent theme of kind of kicking the can down the tier of responsibility made workers bear the burden of a lack of oversight and coordination on every level above them and allowed for kind of every bad actor and wolf at the door to get in and take advantage of that chaos, um, the lack of regulation and the structurelessness. Could you talk about in that same vein, um, what was it called? Project Airbridge. Can you tell our audience about Project um, Airbridge? No. <laughs> it's, I can tell you about it. It's an organizing oh. story to tell. It, it yeah. is a staggering example of nepotism, incompetence, and also you see in a lot of these instances the kind of same neoliberal economic strategy to privatize um, either or push privatization like with Betsy DeVos or to privatize the response. But I think Project Airbridge is unique in that it failed to understand how to privatize correctly yeah. even. They weren't even um, good at privatization. Yeah, that I, I find this staggering. I think our audience would really appreciate if you could give us some details about this. Well, it's it is painful, and and um, and your read of the book is good. Uh, you're you're seeing the 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 real vulnerabilities here, and you know one of the realities of uh, the Trump administration, which I which I realized as I was writing the book and organizing it, is that of course Donald Trump trusted almost no one, and so as a result. Uh, he was not like leaders in other countries, many of whom uh, put a great faith in their scientific community, in their public health officials, in, in people who knew about this stuff. Uh, Trump, uh, he didn't listen to people who gave him good advice, even to his fellow right wingers, even to his fellow Republicans. And there were folks in the White House who were giving him data and saying, you know, look, this is going to be bad. We are going. We should respond in these ways. There are things that we need to do, uh, both uh, because they were concerned about some of them, maybe concerned about public health, but a lot of them just concerned about the political impact. And and yet he wouldn't listen to them. He, as in so many cases, defaulted to the those closest to him, those he would trust. And so he went to Jared Kushner, his son-in-law. And at a critical point early in the crisis, when nurses in hospitals were literally being photographed wearing garbage bags to protect themselves because they did not have sufficient protective gear. Uh, this is becoming deeply embarrassing to the administration. And President Trump said, well, we're going to have to figure out how to make the supply chain work and how to get uh, protective gear from other countries uh, into the United States. Now, there's a whole story, which we may talk about in a moment, about how our free trade deals you know, shut down the industries that could have and should have been producing it here in the U.S. for that, you know, rapid delivery of, of the protective gear and of the medical equipment. But the fact is it was being produced in other countries. And so what uh, Jared Kushner came up with was a plan to use U.S. tax dollars to basically underwrite multinational corporations, which would then use U.S. transit uh, opportunities to get the goods from other countries and bring them to the United States. Uh, very inefficient model, but one that did get, you know, masks and other protective gear to the United States. And then instead of saying, OK, th there's going to be some regulations on you, you're going to get the gear here. Um, you'll make a little profit, but ultimately it will get to the people that need it most. There was very little, almost no regulation. 
And so as a result, the gear that arrived uh, went to the highest bidder. And of course, we, we reinforced all the inequalities in America. We ended up in a situation where the, the people who needed protective gear the most didn't benefit from this massive expenditure of U.S. tax dollars. Uh, we had a public intervention, but it was an intervention on behalf of the bottom line of multinational corporations that ended up making more money out of this, not providing the, the care and the, the support that was needed. It was such a disaster that within months, uh, it was being investigated by congressional committees. It was a complete meltdown. And, uh, you know, Kushner you know, kind of slipped again into something else, like trying to do Middle East peace or whatever, whatever his latest project was. Uh, but the end result was that at a very critical early stage, the supply chain was completely screwed up by uh, making this commitment to, as you suggest, a neoliberal model for, you know, getting vital goods to, to people that needed it. And in some cases, we still suffer as a result of Jared Kushner's scorching incompetence. Yeah, you alluded to this, but can you talk to us about Rahm Emanuel's yes. uh, chapter in the book and the effect of offshoring during the pandemic? Because this is another side of it where you have a kind of uh, economic ideology that mm -hmm. radically warps the ability of regular people, working people and families to get the goods they need. And the pandemic exacerbates this to a degree that makes people, you know, lose their lives. Absolutely. It, it's look, I'm an internationalist. I believe that there are many, many places where trade is valuable and it can work. And, and I understand that. Uh, but I've always understood, and I think a lot of other folks have that free trade deals that are written by folks on wall street that are written for the investor class that are written for multinational corporations, uh, invariably, create a race to the bottom. They're going for the cheapest uh, production costs. As a result, they look for the lowest wages. They look for the least environmental protections. They look often for places that are less small d democratic because they can impose their will more, more quickly. They look for places where unions are weak, et cetera. We understand the storyline. Well, in the 1990s and the 2000s and into the even the 2010s in the United States, uh, we had democratic administrations that embraced free trade. Um, it wasn't the Wall Street Republicans that were doing this. This was Democratic presidents like Bill Clinton. And uh, the one constant through that period, uh, and obviously there were Republicans that were supportive as well, but the one constant through this period was Rahm Emanuel. Rahm Emanuel, who was a political fixer, uh, very close to corporate America, very close to Wall Street, a Democrat, served in a key role in both the uh, Clinton and Obama White Houses. And what he advocated for militantly was a free trade model that made it very, very easy for capital uh, to move industrial production where it was cheapest. End result was that in the United States, we saw a, a almost wholesale offshoring of the production of you know, the safety gear, the, a lot of the medical technology, even a lot of the, the drugs and other things that were important uh, to have at least some level of domestic production. Any country that does any kind of planning says, you know, look, there's some places we just don't want to be left, in, you know, in a lurch here. We don't want to be left without the production capacity to do the things that we need to do. And in the book, you know, one of the first people I interviewed was Sherrod Brown, the senator from Ohio, who's been such a, a strong advocate for, for smarter trade policies. And, and he said, even in March of, of 2020, look, we're going to be in a disastrous situation because we have offshored so much of our production of the things that we need. He was exactly right. And uh, look, the bottom line is that I did a chapter on Ron Emanuel because I wanted to point out first that this isn't just Republicans that are bad players here. There are Democrats who have been bad players, but also something much deeper than that, that the underpinnings of the crisis that we saw when COVID hit, in many cases, went back years, even decades before the current power players were there. That kind of um, long-term analysis is ex it's extremely important, I think. Um, and you can see how 
it's not just economic. When you're highlighting um, certain key figures in the book, you also talk about the political legacies that they're riding on. Mm -hmm. um, one of those people that was particularly striking in the book was Mike Pompeo, who I'm going to say had COVID parties that would make Boris Johnson blush. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. Unbelievable. But aside from that, blatant disregard for his health and others. If I can interrupt you. Oh, you sure. Actually made people come to yeah. them. You know, um, Boris yeah. Johnson, at least, you know, you were sort of a parent, you know, it was a party animal, right? He's just saying, maybe mm -hmm. the party come on over. No, no, no. Pompeo actually had parties that where it was essentially almost like a royal command that people mm -hmm. come to these events. Uh, and these were the families of diplomats. These were these were people who, who A, didn't want to, probably didn't want to be there with Mike Pompeo anyway, but B, um, did not want to have their lives put at risk by the Secretary of State. Yeah. So they interrupt on that. But it's not just, to mention the staff working at these oh, places and everybody workers? else that was exposed. Yeah. 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 Um, but I wanted to focus on one part of his um, foreign policy strategy, which was his extreme anti-Cuba posture mm -hmm. throughout the pandemic when Cuba, this tiny island nation that has been you know, facing a U.S. embargo for decades, is able to send doctors, not just in this crisis, but in other crises, and has the spirit of international solidarity at the heart of their medical complex. He decided he would do everything he could to crush that. Mm -hmm. um, and you quote a military writer who said that Pompeo was throwing banana peels in the path of his successors by formally but oh so very spuriously designating foreign actors he doesn't like as terrorists. Mm -hmm. um, can you unpack that for us? What was Pompeo's strategy there and why? But also, did you see an element of this kind of long-term political sabotage in other players that you profiled in the book? Yeah, I mean, it's, that's a, it's such an excellent question because uh, Pompeo gets a chapter unto himself, but, but this, this pattern, this tendency showed up in, in many other political players. And that is, you know, sort of a longing for the Cold War. You know, people who really uh, do still want to organize the world as, uh, you know, capitalism versus communism and, and uh, a, a, a model that, uh, you know, most people thought, you know, kind of began to deconstruct with uh, the fall of the, the Berlin Wall. But uh, but in Pompeo's world, this was this was a lingering reality, and it trumped, uh, for lack of a better word, his logical uh, path as the Secretary of State of the United States at a point when a global pandemic was hitting. The United States had the capacity and also, uh, in many ways, the the potential to be an important player in making sure that we address the crisis in the United States but also that we address the crisis internationally in ways that could really dial down uh, the, the disease, could address it, you know, so it didn't spread, so it didn't become more and more of a severe crisis. Uh, that's not what Pompeo did. And as we, you've mentioned before, in many of the chapters, I really try to look at the, uh, the human side of this. And one of the human sides of the early stages of the pandemic was that in particular countries around the world, they were overwhelmed. Uh, many folks who followed the pandemic as it was developing watched the, the crisis in Italy, where uh, the Italian healthcare system, was, particularly in Northern Italy, was, was simply overwhelmed at a very, very early stage, at a point where, frankly, people didn't know how to deal with the crisis. And, and so uh, they appealed for, for foreign doctors, and the Cubans responded um, in South Africa, in Caribbean uh, countries, in South America, uh, people who were in a crisis said, okay, who do we know who has really well-trained doctors, often uh, who are trained in dealing with infectious diseases and dealing in a pandemic or epidemic circumstance? Is there, is there someplace we can find more doctors because we need them? And the, the call went out to the Cubans and the Cubans responded. They sent doctors and other medical personnel. And I've seen, you know, I can show you the videos of when they arrived in places like Jamaica, there were, there were Jamaican officials crying, you know, literally, uh, you know, welcoming these doctors because they were bringing vital needed care uh, at, at a critical crisis moment. And Pompeo's response was to tell countries to, to turn them away or to come up with uh, 
procedures that would make it harder for them to come and and literally to create a threat that if you want to be on this good side of the United States, maybe you wouldn't want to accept these doctors who were literally coming to save lives. And uh, one final thing I'll emphasize here is Barack Obama, you know, previous president of the United States had said, you may disagree with Cuba on a lot of stuff. May not, maybe, you know, you don't agree with Cuba on everything, but you got to accept that their doctors are good and that they've done a lot globally. And so for Pompeo to you know, attack that basic understanding at the critical early stages of the pandemic, it just, it, it spoke to, uh, a, this lingering Cold War sensibility, but B, something else that you'd see, you know, going forward, which was that at all sorts of opportunities for international cooperation, Mike Pompeo and other leaders in the United States rejected international cooperation when they should have, in fact, been embracing it. Yeah. Speaking of international cooperation, um, let's talk about Pfizer. Ah. <laughs> you don't name names at Pfizer. You just kind of indict the entire thing. Can you go into your analysis of their response, um, the ways in which they exacerbated things by not sharing um, information with uh, vaccine developments? Can you elaborate on that for our audience? Sure. Um, look, Pfizer really is a stand-in for the pharmaceutical industry as a whole. They're, I believe they were the worst player, but they were certainly not the only bad player. And uh, But one of the things to understand is that it was a global pandemic. And at the beginning of this pandemic, one of the best things that happened was that those who had information shared it. There was a lot of information that was shared uh, via all sorts of platforms so that those who were trying to do a a monitoring of the crisis, but B, develop vaccines, had a tremendous amount of information. That wasn't like proprietary information. It was information that governments and global health groupings and, and other groupings had come together to make available. So the pharmaceutical companies in this case, they didn't like, you know, go into the laboratory and do this, this deep research. Uh, they had a tremendous amount of information that was given to them by the public sector. And then they develop different vaccines. It is, it is true. And there, as we know, Pfizer, Moderna, uh, Johnson Johnson, different vaccines, different quality, different character, different approach. But the baseline came from government, uh, a lot of government sources, a lot of public sources. And uh, yet in this circumstance, because uh, pharmaceutical companies don't really like to do vaccines, they prefer to do drugs that you have to take permanently, uh, vaccine where you just get one shot or a couple of shots. That's not usually the kind of big money maker. So what they did was they, they created relationships with governments that were tremendously beneficial to them. And in the case of Pfizer, they even opted out of some of the basic requirements because they wanted to quote unquote be independent to go forward. But what that meant was that they could charge dramatically more for their doses. And because they rushed their vaccine to the market, they got out there uh, in the first stages, they were able to get all sorts of contracts, including you know, repeating and forward going contracts that allow them to make massive amounts of money. And so let's remember one core thing. Glad the vaccines came. It's a good thing. It's absolutely a good thing. And, and in my view, and, I, and I'm, I'm glad that they became available. But the fact of the matter is that was so much was ceded to the pharmaceutical companies in this case, that uh, as one research grouping uh, identified, you know, about 18 months into the pandemic at a, at a key stage, uh, Pfizer, Moderna, and their partners were making $1,000 a second, $65,000 a minute, $93 million a day, every single minute, every single day, again, again, over and over, piling this money up, making profits that they couldn't even begin to count. And uh, then when, you know, global health groups uh, came and, and said, look, you know, this is a global pandemic. We've got to get these vaccines to people who don't have the ability to get these, you know, kind of great contracts, these sweetheart deals, all this other stuff. Um, Pfizer and Moderna fought, fought, have fought it and their partners have, have continued to fight it. And we've ended up in a situation where the United States and some, you know, countries have relatively, you know, people getting, you know, two vaccinations and a booster and everything like that. We have healthcare personnel in countries around the world that still haven't gotten their first vaccine. And this is absurd. It is an absolutely absurd situation. And one of the things I always remind people of is that during World War II, Franklin Roosevelt said, you know, look, we've got a global crisis. We're fighting against fascism. American companies are going to be able to make a little bit of profit. 
but they're not going to be able to make excess profits and they're going to do what we tell them to do. And the fact is that hasn't happened with Pfizer and these other companies. And uh, the end result is they're making massive profits and they are not, again, sharing sacrifice in the way that so many frontline workers have. Yeah, I think it also really undermines faith in all of this technology when you see the kind of rabid, greedy uh, proliferation of policies that just protect the bottom line of a company or the political prospects of one or another person um, involved in setting them. You, you start to think this is all just cynical. Maybe I am being taken advantage of. Maybe this isn't in my best interest because yeah. it's too couched in a logic that quite frankly, is so dehumanized that it's hard to relate to. It's hard to yeah. relate to the decision to let a bunch, you know, to, to let an entire country suffer, to let millions of people die because it pads your wallet. That is such an important insight. And and I, I really want to, you know, focus in on that for one moment here to to say that, you know, as, as, you, as you can tell, I, I've been vaccinated, got my booster, I'll be first in line for another booster. Uh, and, and I, and I think that there's a lot of tremendous good that comes of this. But the fact of the matter is that we have a tremendous number of people in the United States, uh, who are doubtful about the vaccines, who are skeptical, and, and some of them are skeptical, because politicians have lied to them and, and, and all that. But, you know, I think we have to accept that, that when you have pharmaceutical companies that are profiting at such a high level, right? That feeds into the skepticism. That feeds into um, that 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 gives cynical politicians like Ron Johnson and Rand Paul, uh, who've been terrible players on this, uh, that gives them you know a, an ability to you know kind of scratch that wound, right? To mm -hmm. to in, encourage skepticism. And you know what I say to people is, look, the vaccines are great. I want everybody to have access to them. The fact of the matter is that the way that we've developed our relationships with these pharmaceutical companies has been a barrier to that. And yeah. it's particularly a barrier to the most vulnerable people in the world. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I think that it's also um, kind of unconscionable that America has acted like the pandemic is unique for each country. Yeah. Not that it's a call for global solidarity because our health is related, just like all our well-being is related to every other human being in the world. And I think that it's a, a kind of sad state of affairs to look at future crises um, and wonder if this kind of logic will get repeated when we're having to come together to face climate change or come cool. together to face another pandemic potentially. But you know the answer to that. Right. And that's the painful answer is that unless we yeah. change course and unless we address the fundamental realities of our economic system and our political system that made this a far more deadly and disastrous circumstance than it needed to be, that left hundreds of thousands of people dead who did not need to die, millions of people sick who did not need to be sick, tens of millions of people economically vulnerable when they did not need to be economically vulnerable. Unless we address that, and the first step in that, to my mind, is accountability, and then accountability driving policy, unless we see it in that way, then I will promise you, we will see a repeat of this. And every expert I talked to in writing the book said, there will be more pandemics. A, this pandemic will not go away easily, but B, there will be additional pandemics, and C, they will interrelate with mm -hmm. climate change, right? That mm -hmm. we will we will see that crisis as well. We will also see all the challenges coming with automation. Uh, we, you know, we have a mm -hmm. lot coming at us as a society in this country and around the world. And it's so very clear that we need uh, a healthcare system that responds to the needs of everyone. We need a social safety net that is real and a social welfare system that, that responds to the needs of everyone. And ultimately, we need a way to assure that we can act globally to respond to a global crisis, not to you know, have this sort of nationalist, narrowly focused response that in the end doesn't save lives in mm -hmm. particular countries and certainly doesn't save lives on an international stage. 
That's or crazy. even our own. No, it, yeah, it comes it, back it, to us. Yeah. Um, I did want to foreground something that I think isn't explicitly stated in the book, but I think it comes through how you are so conscientious about the worker's narrative being forward. Mm -hmm. Even though each chapter focuses on a particular person, you really um, take pains to highlight what the people directly affected by their policies felt and what happened to them and the results of that. And in the beginning of the book, you quote something that um, somebody named Chance Zamber, a factory mm -hmm. worker says, yeah. and they said, the company did absolutely nothing when Mike died, he told Bellows. And after that, several more people got it. People were self-quarantining. They didn't have enough people to run the assembly line. The company claimed they benevolently shut the whole line down so everyone could be tested. This was a load of bullshit. Everyone was infected, exposed, or dead. They didn't test people because they gave a shit if we lived or died. They did it so they could prove nothing was wrong and people have to go back to work. So in reading that, I kind of had this insight that was echoed th throughout the rest of the book for me, which is that in failing so spectacularly to kind of take a leadership role and have a central response to the pandemic, the worker safety fell to specific companies. Mm -hmm. And if you're a worker and you have no workplace democracy and no say in one of the most important parts of your life, and then your boss comes in and says, you're going to wear a mask and you're going to get these tests and you need to get vaccinated. Of course, you won't trust that when this person has been exploiting you. Mm -hmm. When you see other uh, you know, colleagues of yours sick and dying, and they're telling you to get back out on the floor and they're doing it by getting you tested finally. So to me, I felt like there was this kind of unspoken theme about the importance of workplace democracy, of workers having control of the conditions of their livelihood. And you showed very, very clearly how we need accountability for those, you know, in power, for the, those in the highest offices. But you also showed how despite this extreme disparity, when you could leverage workplace democracy, you could start to make changes. They mm -hmm. may start out small, but they snowballed. And I just wanted you to elaborate on some of that. I know there's probably a lot of material that isn't in the book, a lot of interviews that you conducted, but I thought that was such an important part of it that I wanted our audience to know more about. Well, it is a vital part. And a lot of it, you'll see some elements of this, some answers to, to your questions and, and good insights in the chapter on Jeff Bezos, because uh, the fact of the matter is that Amazon's a very good example of this. At Amazon, you had workers in the very early stages of the pandemic saying, hey, we're not protected. We're getting sick. Uh, it doesn't look good here. We, we, need to, we need to intervene. And what Amazon's response was to, was to fire uh, one of the leading workers. And uh, and then it kept playing out, right? Because you had the organizing drive down in Alabama, where uh, you had Amazon warehouse workers, the first big effort, and it's still it's now ongoing because of Amazon's you know uh, nefarious ways of of uh, trying to prevent unionization. But uh, you had workers saying, "Look, we need protection, and we need a union. We need some dynamic in which we have a real say." In, in how this is going to go play out because we can't trust the company. And uh, some of the real heroes of my book, and there's a, there's a, this book has, you know, a lot of, a lot of people who, who got sick and died. And, and this is a tragic circumstance. We have uh, some villains and, and talk about them and they, many of the chapters focus on them, but there are heroes in this book. Uh, there are nurses and there's their union, National Nurses United is one example. That, that really did step up and fight and and saved a lot of lives. I, I would, you know, I write a good deal about the nurses union. Uh, they saved lives for their own members, but they saved the lives of patients and, and people that they were caring for. Uh, another example is uh, the transit workers unions. Uh, and, and the transit unions were really on top of this at a very early stage, making passionate demands that, that their members be protected. And, uh, and, and frankly, again, another case where they save lives for their members, but they also save the lives of people who are riding buses and subways and, and other forms of public transportation. Sarah Nelson, who is uh, you know, the head of the flight attendants union, 
uh, was was an absolutely heroic and bold and and I think very very effective leader on this. And you know, again, she was seeking to protect her members, flight attendants, but she also uh, did tremendous work to to protect people who were flying. And and so one of the things we understand is that when you're talking about workplace democracy, it's vital for workers, uh, but it also plays out for society that that when you have workers in a position to make themselves safe, to make sure that their workplace is not you know, a danger spot, not a hot zone, if you will, that also so frequently translates to a circumstance where a community is safer, where families are safer, where society is safer. And so, you know, yeah, if, you wanted to, if, if, uh, if anyone has a question at the end of my book about what solutions are, and I know we'll talk, perhaps talk about that in a moment, uh, one of them unquestionably is uh, to have much stronger unions, much more workplace democracy, much more power to, to workers to protect themselves and the people they serve. You segued into my last question for me. <laughs> yes, um, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> yeah, you can take over. No, no, <laughs> you do the I, next wouldn't, I wouldn't dare. <laughs> So, yeah, I did, I did want to ask you that, you know, you've done so much work kind of at every level getting to know different sides of this crisis. I want to say, like, the book is um, super readable, very accessible. You approach the material in a way where these kinds of dense geopolitical issues or economic issues are really common sense and you're centering the kind of experience of workers in each chapter. I really thought it was a wonderful read. But yeah, tell us, how do we fix it all? Everything you've outlined. No problem. <laughs> how do we solve the problem? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, and I, I appreciate that you ask it that way because that's the way we should, should go at this. I wrote a book that, that uh, seeks to make people angry and uh, that seeks to make people passionate enough to push for the changes that are needed. And so you can't just you know, stoke that anger and not have, have hopefully some solutions. And, and this, the thing I call for is accountability because I really believe that history tells us that accountability drives progress. That if we hold those in positions of political and economic power to a high standard, and if we say when they fail to meet that standard, that they will be punished in some way or another, then that does two things. Number one, it makes those leaders and future leaders more responsible. But B, it opens up a discussion about how do you create a system where individuals who are flawed, who are inclined to fail society, uh, don't get in positions of power where they can, in fact, do that. And, and so I, I think accountability takes many, many forms. I think it can be criminal. And I think there were clearly criminal acts by uh, political leaders and by corporate officials and others that need to be held to account. And I talk about that. There's also civil actions. Uh, one of the most interesting things about the pandemic was the amount of effort that politicians, uh, people ranging from Andrew Cuomo to uh, Mitch McConnell, the efforts they put into uh, creating liability shields that prevented ordinary folks, working class people from suing corporations that had failed to protect them or that had you know, allowed them to get sick, or that had in some other way you know, done a lousy job during this process and had done so deliberately. And luckily we beat a lot of those, those liability shields. It wasn't easy, but um, that's another way of accountability. So criminal, civil, congressional action is absolutely vital. And I think there's simply no question that, that there should be a much deeper congressional inquiry. I, I write in the book about the Pecora Commission back in the 1940 or 1930s, when Franklin Roosevelt was president, they brought in a lawyer who had prosecuted mobsters to go after bankers and to ask the tough questions about why the, the economic depression of the late 20s, early 1930s was so bad, why it was, why, you know, an economic downturn that was global had such devastating Im impacts in the United States. And they held people to account uh, with all sorts of, of legal action but also those hearings led to the regulation of banks and to the regulation of all sorts of industries. So they had a, they had a huge impact. Accountability does and can and should drive uh, progress as regards legislation, progress as regards government. But then there's a, a final element here. I think when we're talking about corporate capital, 
right? and crony capitalism, you know, there we should understand that taxation is a form of accountability. And we should be, this should be front and center right now. What we know is from the great work of the Institute for Policy Studies and other folks that uh, the billionaires had one of the, the best periods in the history of billionaires uh, during the pandemic. The United States went into the pandemic with 614 billionaires, came out, or 18 months later, there were 745. So a huge number of people in a period that was supposed to be one of you know shared sacrifice and really difficult, challenging times entered into the billionaire class. And here's the other thing. The billionaire class in the United States at the start of the pandemic controlled about $3 trillion. Uh, 18 months later, they controlled $5 trillion. And I can guarantee you that amount is now exponentially more. And you know, my standard on this uh, is to say that, that I think Franklin Roosevelt was right. During World War II, uh, we had a 95% tax rate, upper marginal you know, for the, the people in the, the highest levels of, of income. And, and we said, you know, look, these are difficult times. We're, we're in the midst of a really challenging moment and you're, you're gonna pay 95% rate. And, and it worked so well that we kept it into peacetime. We still had an over 90% tax rate for the upper, upper brackets uh, through Dwight Eisenhower's presidency into, into the 1960s. And it didn't stall out our society. It didn't harm us. What it did was, it held those who were economically powerful to account. And it says, it said, you know, in a moment of shared sacrifice, you're going to share. And so I, I think that tax policy becomes a really huge part of this. I also think that, uh, that we don't just talk about taxing individual billionaires. We should be talking about excess profits for corporations too. And, and, you know, these are, these are baseline steps. I'm not suggesting for a moment that this is the end of what we should do. These are, these are beginning steps that we should be talking about. And where does it lead us to? What I spoke about before, remember accountability drives progress. If accountability drives progress, then it must take us to a national health care plan on a single payer model. Uh, it has to take us to a social welfare state that really is genuine. And frankly, it has to open up discussions uh, that go beyond a lot of the traditional models and say that, that are there better ways to organize society? Because if we're dealing with climate change, if we're dealing with an age of pandemics, if we're dealing with an automation moment where we're going to change you know, everything about how we work, shouldn't we recognize that uh, if the coronavirus pandemic taught us anything, it's when big changes come, we're not ready, we're not prepared. And so uh, we have a choice. Either we're gonna have these big changes come and these big challenges in the future, and we're going to be exploited and harmed, or we are going to figure out how to organize a society where the people have an ability to make demands for their health, for their safety, but also for their, their, their livelihoods and for their, their, their capacity to live a, a decent life. I mean, that's what we should be talking about. And it terrifies me. It terrifies me that we might let this pandemic where we've suffered so much loss that we might let it pass without radical change. And that's why I wrote the book. Thank you so much. Uh, the book is, again, Coronavirus Criminals and Pandemic Profiteers, out from Verso Books. If you don't want to line Jeff Be Bezos's yacht, you can purchase it directly from the website. Uh, John, this was such a great interview. I really hope that our audience checks this out. You're right. We can't let things go back to normal and, and forget the lessons that were hard learned with the deaths of almost a million people, 200,000 kids without caregivers or parents. We need to honor their legacy, but also create a world where human life is valued over profit. And I think your book uh, is one of those guideposts. So thank you again for coming on the show. I'm really honored to be with you and, and, and very honored by your, your kind comments. And, and let me tell you that uh, the fact is we've got a lot of work ahead of us. And uh, this is, I'm, I'm excited. I am excited by conversations like this, because at the end of the day, um, if we start to open up this dialogue and tell people that they've got the power to hold uh, those with the economic and political elites to account, that it's happened in the past and it can happen again, I have real faith that, that we can make a, a legacy that honors those who have died, those who got sick, those who suffered during the pandemic and say that this will never happen again. Absolutely. 
Thanks again. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.